What's up, everybody? Welcome to Spax Attack. It's Tuesday. Hope everyone had a great holiday weekend. We're back with a short trading week. We've got an exciting show today. We have an interview with one of the largest SPAC deals that was done in the second quarter. Um, also, you're you're getting Crystalpedia solo today. We have Mitch out. He is actually traveling to Detroit to our headquarters, so you will see him live from Benzinga later this week. So super exciting week for us. Um, but let's get started here. So, you know, over the weekend and this morning, we do have a lot of headlines to talk about. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to be reading through these headlines and also trying to, to share the banners and we'll get into the chart in a little bit. So up first, let's talk analyst ratings. So we have HC Wainwright and Company initiating coverage on Canoe with a buy rating and a price target of $15. So that's G-O-E-V is the ticker. Um, this is one that's struggled recently, right? It got beaten down. Um, they don't have a ton of deals in place. They are a skateboard company where they make the base for these vehicles. Um, but getting a nice initiation here from H.C. Wainwright. So we'll see. Shares are up today, about 6% to 807. Um, so keep an eye on this one, uh, you know, analyst upgrade or initiation here. Then another analyst note today, we have Needham initiating coverage on Rockley Photonics Holdings with a buy rating and a price target of $15, that ticker R-K-L-Y. So Rockley recently completed its SPAC merger. Shares traded up to about 10, uh, I think 1060. Um, we did get a little bit of a squeeze before that. Um, you know, due to the heavy redemption, we were around $16, but over the last couple of weeks, um, really traded below the $10 mark. So uh, keep an eye out on this one. Again, getting the initiation here um, from Needham today. And then we've got Open Door. So Zellman initiating coverage on Open Door with a buy rating, no price target, that ticker OPEN. Um, you know, Open Door has been one of the the better performing ones, right? Uh, it's trading at 1950 right now. This is one that uh, you know six months ago traded at forty dollars. This is a Chamath Polyhop TS SPAC. Um, you know, uh, uh, interesting uh, initiation here again. Buy with no price target, um, but you know uh, we'll keep that one on watch. Then we got news out today from Genius Sports. So a uh, deal with Caesars Entertainment. This shouldn't come as a huge surprise, right, as Genie is the official data provider for the NFL and also Caesars Entertainment is a partner with the NFL for sports betting. So these two, you know, have been linked from the start. It follows a similar deal, deal that DraftKings signed. So this deal will include the official sports data um, from the NFL via Genius Sports. Uh, Caesars is the largest casino entertainment company in the U.S., they're also going to get access to Genius Sports' other content. So that includes next-gen stats, the official data, and, and other sports, which we have covered on the show. Remember that Genie does have earnings tomorrow. Um, so this is a big positive for them, right? That they are getting, you know, all these deals going into earnings, going into the NFL season. So keep an eye out on uh, GENI here today. Great piece of news. Last I looked, shares were up. We're actually down 2% right now to 2068. Remember that shares did move over the last you know week or so. We were up to $22. So uh, you know, could be some profit taking there again. I expect shares to be you know heavily traded tomorrow on that earnings report. So keep an eye out. Those earnings coming before market open. Then over the weekend, I saw an article on Engadget talking about Joby Aviation. So NASA's air taxi tests are moving forward with Joby Aviation. Um, remember, Joby is one of several electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Um, so, you know, they tested this quietly, it says, on August 30th, that test uh, lasting through September 10th. Um, this is the first EVTOL test as part of an advanced air mobility campaign. Um, so the FAA and NASA both working with Joby here. Um, the data with the flight program will help with a fuller set 
of campaign tests in 2022 involving both other taxis and a more complicated flight situation. Um, so keep an eye out on J-O-B-Y. Uh, again, this was an article in Engadget. Um, I didn't see a ton of press coverage on this one. Speaking of press coverage, though, over the weekend, we did get an article from CNBC calling the SPAC boom over. Um, if you are looking for a top or a bottom, it could potentially be right now with CNBC, you know, now saying that the SPAC boom is over. For those who have followed the SPAC market for a long time, you know that there are waves and that there are many good companies out there and also bad ones. So it's important to do your own research and find the winners. Then we got some approvals last week. So one of them was SOAC approving their merger with Deep Green Metals. That new ticker will be TMC. 90.9% uh, of shares were redeemed and also only 110 million of the 330 million pipe was received as some of the pipe investors backed out. Um, keep an eye on this one. And full disclosure, I am long shares of SOAC. I got in last week expecting the heavy redemption on this name. Um, could she see shares spike up as that float is going to shrink? Um, so SOAC, I do expect shares to eventually come down as this company is pre-revenue, um, but keep an eye out on this one. We did get two other uh, vote date sets. So we have Fuse setting their date, 921 with Moneyline and CAHC setting a merger vote date of September 28th with Lumira. Uh, DX. And then also we had a rumor of a Bridgetown BTWN to bring Traveluka public. That's an Indonesian uh, travel site. That deal has now been uh, called off. It, of course, wasn't a completed deal. It was just a rumor. But uh, Bloomberg now saying that Traveluka likely to do an IPO instead. And then we turn to the calendar. We do have three votes this week. We have SFTW voting on their merger with Black Sky on the 9th, RICE voting on their merger with Area Energy and Arkea Energy. And on the 10th, we have Quell uh, voting on their merger. And then also, as I said, we have earnings tomorrow from Genius Sports, G-E-N-I. Uh, so a lot going on in SPACs. And again, only one deal completed last week. And, you know, we need to see more deals get announced, um, you know, as there are still many, many out there. So that's what I've got uh, for headlines. Uh, again, we do have an exciting interview coming up later on on the show. Uh, running solo here. So go ahead, drop your, uh, you know, comments in the chat. Let me know how I'm doing and we'll get to some ticker time Later on, it looks like I have uh, producer AB here chilling with me. What's going on, Aaron? Uh, you know, welcome to Spax Attack. Hanging out today while Mitch is gone. Uh, what, what is up, Chris? It, it's an honor. You know, yeah, I just off. I wanted to be here to to help out. Mitch isn't here today, but that doesn't mean we're not going to do Spax Attack. We do, as you mentioned. You know, have a pack show interview coming up in about five minutes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I was I was listening to your headlines. Obviously, you pay more attention to what's going on in the SPAC world um, than I do. But one that I've been kind of like watching, looking out for, Chris, is uh, the eToro deal. Yes, yes. FTCV. You know, uh, Aaron, we, we talked about that on Thursday or Friday. The, the thing that got me real excited recently is they just announced a new head of the U.S. division. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, she comes with the history from like, TD Ameritrade, um, and a couple other brokers. I mean, I think they're going heavy on their U.S. expansion. Right now, you can only trade crypto on eToro in the U.S. or do those copycat portfolios. They're going to launch, you know, stock trading later this year. That's a huge catalyst for me. I, I think the crypto market is huge, but I think once people can, you know, do crypto and stock on their exchange together, I think that's huge. What, what, are, you, what are you liking about eToro here? I just, I mean, I know it's like a, a huge global company and um, do we, do we have any other kind of comparable companies that have gone the SPAC route uh, of going public? Um, I don't think directly as far as the exchange, there's been a couple crypto companies that have gone public via SPAC and some currently, you know, in the process, but 
the majority of the the fintech plays are more heavily tied to you know um, banking or credit cards. We did have SoFi, which SoFi has a little bit of experience, you know, with um, crypto and with stock trading. Um, and that one's done, you know, okay since despacking. But I mean, eToro, it's a global brand, like you said. They're they're huge in Europe, um, and I think they can expand their market share in the U.S. I mean. There's a lot of brokers to choose from in the U.S., but some of them, Aaron, have been kind of hated on recently. So I think people are always looking for a new broker. And the other thing is uh, advertising, right? So eToro did a huge, huge advertising campaign uh, in the U.S. when they launched crypto, right? I think they had Alec Baldwin in it. Um, we're, we're seeing that with SoFi now, right? SoFi is spending a ton of money. Um, you know, they're sponsoring like Dude Perfect videos on YouTube. They're sponsoring uh, Pompliano's new show. Um, what do you think? Do you think eToro does, you know, heavy, heavy spending here in the U.S. to really get that brand out? Yeah, I mean, I, I could see them following suit with uh, SoFi. Of course, the uh, Los Angeles Rams and Chargers are playing in the SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles. So companies like that have to fork up a lot of money for, for you know, naming rights of stadiums like that. Um, we, we saw something similar. I think FTX purchased yep. the naming rights of the arena down in Miami. Um, so definitely these crypto players come in. I know eToro is not just a pure crypto company, but it definitely has exposure in the crypto space, has a lot of money to spend um, for that exposure. And speaking of SoFi, the stock's having a very strong day today. Let me check back in on it. See, um, up about 4.5% right now, but it was up uh even more more than that you know it was up all the way to sixteen dollars and twelve cents and now it's kind of traded back down to 1584 so i have my eyes on sofi today any other individual names you've kind of been watching chart wise today chris you know we we talked a little bit about clover health last week clov and that one's up 10 percent today it seems like that one's cycling back through the news um as far as you know a potential short squeeze high short interest um, so I've been watching that one. I think we pushed past ten dollars. Um, it's trading, you know, right around the the nine sixty level. So I don't think it takes much to move to ten. And once it moves to ten, I think it gets you know another leg up. Um, you know, catapult KPLT is one we talked about last week. That one's moving, and, and that one is it, it, got two stories going for it. Right, catapult has high short interest. And then also it is a buy now, pay later. So AB, if you know the, the Affirm story, right? Affirm partnered with Amazon. So Catapult is like the little brother to Affirm. So right now, if you go on Wayfair and you try to buy a product and you try to get approved for buy now, pay later with Affirm, let's say Affirm rejects you. You know, maybe your credit's not good enough or they don't want to take a chance on you. Well, they then send you as a customer to Catapult. So Catapult gets clients from a firm, you know, that fell through the cracks. Well, Catapult doesn't have a deal with Amazon, but if they can partner with a firm on that Amazon relationship, I mean, that would be a huge catalyst. Again, that's just kind of speculation at this point, but I think there's two stories there with Catapult, you know, the high short interest and then also the, the a firm, you know, getting that lift on the Amazon news. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I was talking to Spencer about this stock last week, actually, and I was kind of saying, I'd rather have the leader in the space, which obviously is a firm. Um, but Spencer brought up a good point, you know, that every Coke needs a Pepsi and, you know, <laughs> Uber, you Uber, Uber and Lyft. So, it, you know, if this industry, if we expect it to keep growing, um, you know, then it, then maybe it's not bad to have some exposure over both names. But I, I don't know how I feel. I mean, like, could like this potentially on a large scale, if everyone's doing the buy now, pay later, could cause some like debt issues down the road. And I yeah. think it, it, it all depends on like how the um who the borrower who the borrower is. Like I don't know a firm or catapult's um process in vetting like who they're lending the money to to make sure that these uh, I, so, so I, I know for a firm they don't they like advertise zero interest. Um, which of course like relies on the person making on-time payments. And then if there's any late payments, then there's fees charged on those. Um, so I think for a lot of like these companies like to bring in revenue, they're actually like hoping their customers are late on payments, which like, it, you know, I, I just don't know if I'm in love with the business model, but I think both these names are going to be like, you know, we're going to have to keep our eye on them, Chris. 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the the paycheck lending stores, right? right? The check and go and the others. It, it, they make money and they make money from people, as you said, being late, right? On payments, people over borrowing, um, you know, so there is some, you know, moral issues there. So I, I agree. Um, but a firm has earnings this week, I think on Thursday, maybe I want to say. Um, so catapult, you know, could get a sympathetic lift from that as well. So it's a story I've been watching, but again, you know, I'm not in catapult. It's already gotten quite a move over the last week. Um, you know, so interesting one, Aaron, it looks like our guest is here. Um, so I'm going to get into the interview and then, you know, maybe Aaron, if you want to join me at the end, we can get into, you know, some watch list and some ticker time, uh, later on. Beautiful. Let's do it, Chris. All right. I'll let you get to it. Awesome. Well, joining us on SPAX Attack today, we have Alex Rodriguez. He's the CEO and co-founder of Embark. That company is going public with Northern Genesis Acquisition 2. Ticker is N-G-A-B. Alex, welcome to SPAX Attack. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, let's dive in. You know, you had a SPAC deal that was announced in the second quarter of this year. So the the first question we always like to start with is why the decision to go public via SPAC and was a traditional IPO also a consideration for your company? Yeah. So uh, I, I would say we we certainly considered everything. In fact, uh, you sort of look at all the different funding options all the way from Embark is, is quite uh, well funded, even just from our balance sheet. So there's a world where, where we might even not have raised money at this point. We obviously looked at IPO. We obviously looked at SPAC. Um, we looked at private round. And I think um, out of all of those, what was really attractive about the SPAC for us was two things. One was the people we get to work with. I think as we scale Embark into a, a large public company, uh, this is obviously a very new uh, challenge for myself. Um, for uh, This is my first time running a public company. And so having the opportunity to work with uh, Ian and Chris, uh, Ian Robertson, the the uh, CEO of Northern Genesis, um, is super helpful. They've been running a public, publicly traded twelve billion dollar utilities company for thirty years, and so um, that experience is invaluable. And then I think the second one for us is the opportunity to really get investors up close and personal with the technology. So, Embark uh, is a company that makes self driving truck software, uh, and that's the sort of uh, technology where really we're a technology story. Um, we obviously have, uh, I think, a really unique, great business model, great team, but ultimately the value comes from the software we've built. Um, and so the opportunity to be able to bring a lot of, uh, sort of bring a, a, a world-class uh, SPAC partner in to put them in the truck, drive them around, let them actually see and feel firsthand, and then have that as another proof point when we went out to talk with the broader market um, that ended up being really helpful in our view. Awesome. So, you know, you mentioned the Northern Genesis team. Uh, we had Ian on SPACs Attack before to talk about that other deal that Northern Genesis did. Uh, you know, great SPAC team. Uh, this deal also comes with, you know, some pretty strong, well-known names as part of the pipe. Uh, Sequoia Capital, Canada Pension Plan, and Knight Swift Transportation. Can you talk a little bit about the pipe investors and the validation that that could bring for a company like Embark. Yeah, we're really excited about the pipe. I think it, it came together really well. We have a $200 million pipe on top of a $414 million trust. Um, and yeah, you mentioned some of the great anchor investor names there. So we really tried to, to get a good cross section of investors. Um, when th you think about somebody like a Sequoia, super high quality private company name, um, CPPIB, Canada Pension Fund, uh, super high quality public company name, uh, Knight Swift, super high quality strategic. Knight is uh, the biggest uh, truckload carrier in the United States. So, uh, you know, for people who aren't in the logistics world, it's a name that's maybe a little bit less well known. But for people who are in logistics, Knight Swift is the name uh, when it comes to, to buying and owning trucks. Uh, and so certainly being able to have um, a good cross section is, is what we were looking for. Um, so not just strategics or not just uh, sort of more traditional venture, um, but really high quality technology investor, high quality public company investor, uh, high quality strategic investor, uh, really to get a, a good spectrum uh, across that pipe investment. 
Perfect. So, you know, uh, you mentioned a little bit about what Embark is all about, you know, with the uh, the trucking industry. Uh, can you just give us, you know, for anyone out there watching, give us the overview of, you know, how Embark started and what Embark is all about. Yeah. Yeah. It's always, that's always a good place to start. <laughs> so, so Embark is uh, maybe, maybe I'll get, I'll go through a couple of pieces just for the, for the, uh, the audience here. So, um, the we're, Embark is focused on building driverless trucks. And so the idea is that we build software that allows 18 wheelers, semi trucks to go out on the road to operate, uh, without somebody inside that truck. And then obviously improve the safety, the fuel economy, the efficiency, uh, of the U S trucking market and to create a whole bunch of brand new local driving jobs that, uh, are where people are able to work in a single city. And what do I mean by that last thing? I think that last thing is really interesting. Um, what we do is Embark's technology really focuses on highway driving. And so we'll go from highway adjacent location to highway adjacent location. And this works really, really well because it allows us to have a simple task for the technology. The self-driving tech works best in a well-defined scope and highway driving is a well-defined scope. At the same time, it allows us to create a whole new set of jobs that are really attractive for the next generation of tracker. Um, and this is a, a, a huge problem in the industry where um, there's this very large driver shortage. And so we're able to create a job that's attractive to you know, millennials, even, even younger uh, folks that really need to be that next generation of trucker. So that's, that's kind of piece one, um, is building software to make trucks drive themselves. And that's gonna be revolutionary for a $700 billion trucking industry. Piece two, um, so you think about there's about five companies total that have serious funding to go after uh, this opportunity. Uh, of those five, Embark is the one that's been doing it the longest. So uh, we're the longest running company in terms of testing self-driving trucks on public roads in the US. Uh, and over that time, we've built, built a number of key innovations. And I'll, I'll just point to two. Uh, one is Embark is unique because we're asset light. So instead of trying to build a whole fleet or build our own truck. Embark is focused on building software. And then we license it on a per mile basis to uh, major fleets. The second one I'd highlight is our technical strategy is very different. Uh, a lot of our competitors rely on these uh, high definition maps that need to be constantly updated in order to, to keep the trucks running. And Embark's taken a very different approach. We built a proprietary technology called Vision Map Fusion which allows the truck to actually recognize and adapt to the road in real time. Um, and so I think uh, you can sort of think about the business as a whole. Uh, and, and what we think is that by focusing on building great software for this particular problem, we can bring uh, something that's a lot more realistic to market. So my background, I spent 15 years doing robotics now. Um, and if you go, you sort of go back in, in my experience, one of the things I learned is, how much it matters to focus on building something real. And so Embark's focus is really not being a science fair project, not you know, trying to do everything for everyone, but focusing on a very specific problem so that we can build a great product for our customer. Um, and I, I know that's not, uh, in, in some sense in the business world, that's not the building a great product is not such an innovation. I think in, uh, in the world of, of robotics and, and R&D companies, um, Embark really stands out as, as a company that focuses on um, building great software for a very clear use case. Perfect. So, you know, one of the things that we've heard with a lot of uh, trucking companies, right, and the self-driving industry, and, and you mentioned it a little bit there, I, I want to dive into this. So there's a large national driver shortage, um, you know, and Embark is a company that can improve costs for carriers can you talk a little bit about, you know, this national driver shortage, how, how you know, how much the, the mileage cost and, and all that for these trucking companies and how Embark can really improve this huge, huge uh, TAM industry? Yeah, the driver shortage is, is absolutely one of the most fundamental things going on in the trucking industry right now. If you talk to any fleet, if you read their 10Ks, you're going to end up with uh, hearing a lot about the driver shortage because it's, it's a huge problem. Um, and it's really driven by quality of life. Um, truck driving is a pretty well-paying job. It's, it's not a pay problem. Uh, it's a quality of life problem. 
And you can really see that borne out if you look at the difference. So there are two types of trucking. We'll do a little ed education here. Um, uh, there's truckload and there's less than truckload. Um, there are a few others, but those are kind of the two biggest. Um, and in less than truckload, in general, drivers are able to stay within a single city and it's, it's sort of broken up into these smaller routes. Um, and turnover in less than truckload is typically in the teens. So like, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20%. Um, truckload uh, tip is over the road. And so people will be out for weeks at a time, sleeping in the back of the truck. Trucks have little beds in the back. Um, and on over the road trucking, you'll see turnover in 90 plus percent often in many years it'll be over 100 percent so that means if you have 100 drivers in your fleet at the beginning of the year you need to hire 100 drivers just to have the same number of drivers in the fleet at the end of the year and that's obviously a huge problem for for trucking companies and so when you look at the opportunity that embark brings it's a couple of things we're able firstly to really to break up a big long route so you might have like a la to dallas which is a you know, uh, almost 2000 miles. Um, and we're able to go in and, and, uh, break that up into a local LA route where there's a local driver, a local Dallas route, and then a big, long driverless component that goes in between the two. Um, and so that allows us to create local jobs that are those, you know, teens percentage turnover jobs instead of the hundred percent turnover jobs. And so that really brings in that next generation, who, who frankly wants, you know, a totally reasonable thing, which is they want to be able to go home to their families every night. Um, and so that's one thing we sort of change to create more attractive jobs for more drivers. But we're also able to greatly improve efficiency. So uh, we look at the overall cost of, of sort of that long haul portion, the driver's about a third of the cost. Uh, you also have fuel economy where we're able to significantly improve fuel economy by driving more efficiently. Um, speeding up, slowing down, picking the right speed. Uh, we're also able to improve the long-term uh, efficiency of the vehicle. They're able to be uptime of 24 hours a day instead of uh, there's a federal limit of 14 hours a day uh, on duty. And so each of those brings a lot of, a lot of efficiency. And we estimate, if you think about a, an average cost of about $2 a mile, uh, you can save about 80 cents in terms of operating cost by using a driverless truck. That's really transformational, especially in an industry where you're typically talking about six to ten percent margins. Awesome. So, you know, another area I, I want to get into is, you know, it, it looks like for the time being, Embark is focused exclusively on the U.S. trucking market. You know, obviously the U.S. has, you know, one of the largest trucking markets in the world. Um, but we also know, you know, there's some other countries out there and some of your competitors, you know, have been testing trucks in Asia and, and working over there. So why is it important that Embark is going this route and focusing exclusively on the U.S. trucking market right now? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's just a matter of focus, right? And there, there's a huge benefit to, to being focused in what you're doing. And so Embark really benefits, I think, from having our, our research and development efforts are in the United States, our testing operations are in the United States, our partnerships are in the United States, our regulatory engagement is in the United States. Um, we have the former Secretary of Transportation on the Board of Directors at Embark, uh, who also happens to be the former Secretary of Labor. So uh, some good experience to help with a lot of these, these job issues, with uh, safety issues. And we think really bringing all of that together in one location is a huge advantage um, because it, it means that we have the expertise, the relationships to bring this to market in a rapid fashion. So another question I'm already seeing, you know, pop up in the in the chat here and was on my sheet as well is, you know, partners. So, you know, I mentioned Night Swift, part of the pipe you already have some existing partners, you already have some customers that you're working with. Can you just break down, you know, the, the spectrum of partners in terms of both trucks and maybe some uh, clients and customers, um, you know, who are strategic partners at this point too? Yeah. So Embark has a, a pretty broad spectrum of, of partners. We obviously think it's really important to be bringing this to market as a, as a product. Um, and so a big part of that is that we're actually moving freight with a lot of major partners today. 
Um, typically that'll be at small scale and we'll have safety drivers in the vehicle still. Um, but we're out there, we're moving freight today. And so this isn't, this is something that, that we think is pretty important. Um, the high level numbers are uh, Embark's partners represent over 30,000 trucks uh, and over $20 billion of freight spend. And so that's a huge, uh, a huge number of folks and certainly a, a, a huge basis to roll this technology out in. Um, just to give a couple of names sort of from that list, uh, you mentioned uh, Knight and Swift, uh, also Warner Enterprises, another major fleet, uh, AB InBev, uh, uh, maker of, of Budweiser, among many other things, uh, who does a lot of uh, forward-leaning tech work. We also work with uh, HP. We work with a number of other uh, major U.S. truckload players. Um, and so it's, we try and have a good spectrum. We work pretty closely uh, with, with sort of people across the ecosystem. Uh, but yeah, the, those top level numbers, 30,000 trucks, $20 billion. And we're, we're really just getting started. We've focused very intentionally on a handful of high quality names. Um, and we've, we've turned down a lot of folks so far, uh, given, given the scale, uh, is, is still ramping up. Awesome. Can you, uh, you know, break down a little bit, the, the timeline, for Embark. So what should uh, investors and potential investors be looking forward to, you know, over the next couple of years to get this uh, service, you know, launched? Yeah. So Embark's laid out uh, a roadmap, a technical roadmap that, that sort of goes all the way back to uh, our first testing in 2016. Um, and so there's 16 milestones in terms of technical capabilities of which we've already delivered 11. And so there's five more technical uh, capabilities that are, are being completed over the next couple of years. And these are um, long tail problems. So the, the core driving behavior is there, the truck can drive itself from, from end to end without, without needing a, a human driver. Um, but where we're continuing to invest is areas like going through inspection stations, um, being able to, we recently demonstrated the ability to do unmapped construction, which Embark is the only company uh, so far to do. Uh, uh, we're working on um, the ability to handle evasive maneuvers when you get, get near a collision, to be able to handle mechanical failures like a blown tire. Uh, and so there's five of these. We lay them out in the, uh, in the investor deck if you want to want to have a look at that. I'd say that's the first thing. And so over the, we've been doing two to three a year pretty consistently since the beginning of the company. So we got five more. Uh, we, we announced one this year. Uh, and we're sort of looking forward to to continuing to bring people along uh, every every couple of quarters as you see uh, these these milestones getting hit, um, and then t- sort of that brings us towards the ultimate the ultimate piece here, which is our scale commercial launch. And scale commercial launch is going to happen in 2024. Um, and uh, sort of as we work towards that, that's both finalizing those technical elements. And continuing to add high quality partners, continuing to scale out our network. Uh, I think we're going to have some pretty exciting announcements on, on both those fronts uh, that w- will ultimately allow us to deploy this, this tech at scale. I think one thing I'll highlight that's a little bit different about Embark versus other businesses is um, in a lot of startups, you are working your sales motion at the same time as you're iterating on the, the product and you sort of launch early and then figure it out as you go. And because of the safety critical nature of what we're doing, um, you, can't, you can't launch early without a safety driver. You have to really have a, a, a dialed in product, has all the features necessary right out of the gate, super safe. And so because of that requirement, it means that you have a longer period where you continue to be in development. But then when you get to, to sort of that scale commercial launch, we've laid all the groundwork so that we are iterating on the business in the background. We've got relationships with Knight Swift, with HP, with AB. Um, and we've got uh, the scale required to be able to have that, that sort of light switch moment, uh, which just looks a little bit different, right? Uh, than a company that starts with a half-baked product and iterates, uh, iterates on revenue. Awesome. So, you know, uh, another area I just want to ask about quick is, you know, Obviously, uh, pre-revenue, you've got that roadmap laid out. So we do have some financial projections. So $867 million in fiscal 2024, $2.77 billion in fiscal 2025. 
Can you just kind of break down, you know, how much of this is coming from existing uh, partners and customers and how much of it, you know, is just uh, forecasted out there? Uh, just give us kind of the, the breakdown of how these numbers add up. Yeah. So, so the way to think about this is the, the 2024, 2025 numbers are, are forecast, but we've spent a lot of time with our partners and we feel very good that these forecasts represent um, sort of a, a, a midline growth rate for the technology. And the reason we can say that is you know, just to give you a sort of the, you know, the, the Cole's notes here. Um, we've spent a lot of time looking at our, our partners' networks. We have uh, full sort of readouts of lane level data that we've sat down and gone through, Hey, what lanes can be converted when based on the rollout schedule. Um, and just to give a, a back of the envelope number, you think about here we are sitting in 2021, we're talking about launch in 2024 to hit that 867 number. We need approximately 6,500 trucks on the road. If you take just the existing partners that Embark has, and then you narrow it down and you say, just the lanes that we're going to launch in 2024 because 2024 we're only launching the u.s sunbelt uh and the rest of the country is in 26 so you look at just the 2024 launch lanes in just the partners that we have today that represents approximately 5900 trucks and so uh, we need 6500 trucks we have 5900 trucks in the partners we work with today and we're just getting started and so um what we feel really good uh that sort of the rollout schedule there makes a lot of sense and I think it's really benefited from the fact that we are an asset light player. Embark is a software player. And so when we look at the rate that we can scale up, it's, it's about what is the rate that we can scale up our software as a service offering. And that's inherently so much higher um, than if you were trying to do the, the full thing, you know, own your own trucks, that's going to be a lot more complex. Awesome. So, you know, the other question I wanted to ask, and we touched on it a little bit, but the chat's already going crazy with it is, you know, talking about competition, right? So I mentioned the the US centered business model. And also you talked about, you know, a, a SaaS model. Um, you know, the big question out there is, of course, naming too simple TSP. Uh, can you just share, you know, how Embark is different from a company like Too Simple and maybe some other competitors out there? Yeah, I think Embark is is pretty different for for a bunch of reasons, and we've been really built what I think is by far the most specialized product for this application. So you think about Embark being asset light in contrast to some of our competitors, including uh, the one the one you were just talking about, who are trying to own their own asset base. And Embark is really a software as a service provider. So that makes us really different and much more scalable. Uh, our technology is really different. Uh, we have this Vision Map Fusion uh, tech, which we've built out, which nobody else has, which we're in the process of, uh, in the process of patenting. Um, and that allows us to handle construction without having to remap the road every time. And we think that's a huge differentiator. Um, and then the, just the maturity of our program, uh, Embark, has been at this for longer than anybody else in terms of public road testing. Uh, and we've been able to bring together an amazing network of partners, whether that's shippers like HP, whether that's carriers like Knight Swift or Werner, uh, or whether that's the team that we've built, uh, including uh, our engineering team, which includes uh, world-class folks who've been at this well over a decade. Uh, and there really aren't that many people who've been doing self-driving well over a decade. And so I think, um, we're, we're really proud of being able to put that as, that together as well. And so that'd probably be my, my three things. I think being asset light, hugely different, being application specific, uh, and the technology we've developed around that, like Vision Map Fusion, uh, and then the quality of the team that we built uh, as the longest running player in the space. Awesome, Alex. Well, before we let you go, uh, I do have some questions here from the chat, if you don't mind. That's one of the things we, of course, like to do here on SPACs Attack. We're, yeah, we're fully transparent. We'd love to get the information to our viewers and your potential investors. Um, we have a question here from Sue. Who are their clients, which you already answered, but how old is Embark? So how long has Embark been around? And you know, when did you start doing the, the testing? Uh, so we got our first truck in August of 16. So a little bit more than five years ago now. Awesome. And then, you know, I'm curious on this question as well. 
So NCAL here, um, how many miles testing does Embark have? But the second part of this question too, are they getting any pushback from state regulators and labor unions? Is that an issue that Embark has seen or something that you foresee in the future? Yes, we've driven well over a million miles on the fleet. So we have a lot of experience on road. And I'll highlight, um, not only have we driven sort of that, that million plus miles, but we've done so without a single uh, DOT reportable incident or accident. So when we look at the safety record of the, the trucks, it's, uh, it's, it's the best in the industry. So we're super proud of that. Um, in, in terms of uh, regulators and unions, I think what's important here is it really matters to be engaged. Um, so people have questions and it matters that we're involved and we're not just kind of ignoring that. And we spend a lot of, a lot of time and effort getting to know folks. So we, uh, we spend a lot of time with, with the state and with the federal regulators. Um, we actually, you might be surprised to know this, but we actually have a, 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 a relationship with uh, the Teamsters as well. We will we'll meet with them pretty regularly. Um, now, you know, we obviously don't see eye to eye on everything, uh, but I think we bring a lot of value to the table for these guys, for the regulators, uh, we're bringing safety. Regulators want to see zero, zero road fatalities and self-driving is the way to do that. For the unions, we bring better quality jobs. Unions want their, their uh, members to be able to work in jobs that, that match their lifestyle, that allow them to be near their families. And we're able to deliver that for them. Um, and so uh, I think it's just about, about having those conversations, about being engaged. Um, that's part of why uh, Secretary Chow is on the board. It's part of why I've been investing on this for many years. Um, but it's an ongoing conversation, and it's something that, that Embark uh, continues to prioritize. I, I've got a great question here for someone who either watched our past interview we did with Lion Electric or heard you mention Ian and the Northern Genesis team. So, of course, Northern Genesis brought Lion Electric public with their first spec. I don't know if you can comment on this, Alex, but are you working closely with Lion Electric? Is there any you know synergies there uh, having that SPAC relationship with Northern Genesis team. Yeah, well, so uh, what I'll say is that we love the Lion guys. Uh, I, I've met the team. They're obviously, uh, you know, huge advocates of, of Ian and Chris and the Northern Genesis team and part of the reason that, that we decided to, to go with this SPAC brand. Um, I think uh, what Lion is doing is, is really exciting. And uh, what I'll say is that one of Embark's unique value propositions is we've designed our technology in a modular way that's designed to be cross-platform. And so uh, it's, it's relatively straightforward uh, for us to sort of integrate the technology onto future fuel vehicles uh, so that you can see electric or even hydrogen trucks that are, that are running Embark technology in the not-too-distant future. Um, so nothing today to announce about the Lion folks, but, but we built our tech in such a way that it's, it's easier to integrate with those future fuels um, and, uh, we certainly, we certainly are keeping close eye on, on how that's developing and, and, uh, yeah, you might see, might see some, some interesting stuff. We certainly did not not think about it when we were, uh, when we were deciding to work with Northern Genesis. Awesome. Well, thanks for the question, Brad and Alex, thanks for answering the best you could on that one. Um, you mentioned launching, you know, in the Sun Belt first and then other areas rolling out. I've got a couple questions here about, you know, weather conditions, road conditions. So up first, we've got, you know, are they testing in mountain conditions? I also saw a comment about, you know, that thing that we get here in Michigan all the time, snow and blizzards. Can, can you kind of break down, you know, how does Embark's technology, uh, you know, work with all these various types of weather that are happening while these trucks are being uh, driven? We are testing in mountain conditions. Uh, there's some mountain passes if you want to be able to go through the Sun Belt, and so we, we run through those. Um, we also run through a, a variety of different inclement weather, whether that's dust, whether it's rain. Uh, the thing that we don't do today is snow, um, but we do pretty much everything else. So we've, we've been running on the I-10 for years now, and we've run through pretty much everything that you can see on the I-10. Um, the the sort of extension out to snow is something that uh, I think our technology is really well suited to vision map fusion works really well because it has that adaptability to be able to, to adapt in real time. Um, but when we think about sort of sequencing, it's just a question of what is the best set of features to complete first so that we can bring a product to our customers. And we, we think of um, the U S Sun Belt as a very big market where we can 
bring this together faster uh, and, and the snow features will land in sort of the next major revision after that. Awesome. Well, Alex, I think that's going to do it for questions. We got some great questions out of the chat today as well. So thanks as always, you know, to our viewers for asking those great questions. And Alex, thank you for, you know, uh, taking the time to answer those chat questions as well. Sometimes they can be, you know, a, a little on the, the, the surprise of the spectrum, but we always appreciate the honesty. So guys, again, joining us on SPAX Attack today, Alex Rodriguez, the CEO and co-founder of Embark, that company going public via SPAC with Northern Genesis Acquisition 2. The ticker is NGAB. Alex, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on SPAX Attack today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been fun. Awesome. Well, guys, that is going to do it for that great interview. Let me know in the in the comments what you thought, right? This is a great company. We've talked about, you know, self-drive uh, trucking industry for a long time, right? It's an industry that, uh, you know, could use some uh, newness to it. And here you have a, a great company working to bring that technology to market. I, I really like the, the SaaS model, right? Uh, software as a service. They're charging those customers on a per mile basis, right? And that asset light business model, right? They're not building the trucks. They don't have to have that huge infrastructure, that huge cost base there, right? They're instead focusing on, you know, selling their software out, you know, under that SaaS business model. So um, AB, whenever you're ready to, to hop back on, we can talk about this interview and also get to some tickers and what's moving. So guys in the chat again, smash that like, you know, Chris running solo today and I've got my friend AB here with me. So no money, Mitch, um, but we're doing all right. But I got to get those likes up. You know, uh, if I get less than a hundred likes, I think Mitch is going to be pretty disappointed in today's show. I don't want to let him down, you know, while he's flying to Detroit right now, he's on a plane. He can't be watching this. So smash that like, uh, you know, for SPACs attack, so we can keep this great show going. Um, but let me know what you think of NGAB, right? It, it's a couple years away. Um, that's what I'm seeing in the comments right now. AB, what what do you think? Uh, what did you take away? Uh, you know, Embark, uh, self-driving uh, trucking technology. I, I like the asset light business model and the SaaS, right? We always talk about SaaS, right? Software as a service, these companies that can charge, you know, on a per- uh, you know, in this case, per mile basis. I, I like that that structure here. Yeah, Chris. I mean, I, I think, you know, a lot of companies in this industry are very, uh, you know, appealing right now. I mean, anything in like the EV self-driving space, because it's just such a new uh, thing, you know, like even though some of these assets are a little bit um, expensive, you know, if you're looking at something like ChargePoint or of course, Tesla, um, they might be a little expensive, but it's such a new industry that we have a chance right now to get in very early. Yeah. And AB, I saw, you know, we talked with, uh, you know, Catapult, we talked a little bit about the, the moral issues, right? So there were a couple of uh, comments raised in the chat about self-driving trucking. What could that mean for, for jobs, right? So we have to look at, you know, is there a moral issue here of, you know, less jobs for the trucking industry? But the thing I always hear AB is, that there is a huge driver shortage for trucks. So it's not like, you know, they're at capacity and we're taking all those jobs away. I think this will just strengthen the industry. And, you know, I, I think we're going to be under a hybrid model for many years, right? Where there's still drivers. Some don't have drivers. Some have, you know, limited involvement from the driver. Um, what do you think about self-driving and the possible impact on jobs here? Yeah, I mean, Chris, if you look back, back in like the 40s and 50s, um, there were, you know, people writing about, oh, the development of computers was going to put accountants out of jobs or, you know, all these people out of jobs. And they were basically saying we shouldn't develop computers or, you know, and all this stuff. And it, in reality, the opposite ended up happening, that and, um, the technology created jobs. And there's numerous studies out there that support that, that innovation creates jobs as opposed to you know, automation, um, stamping out jobs. Um, but I mean, look, I mean, it, it will be interesting because the Teamsters, the truck drivers do have a lot of power as far as like one of the most powerful unions in the country. So do I think that there will be some people fighting 
um, self-driving trucks. Yeah, hundred percent. But do I think in the long run that this will uh, essentially disenfranchise a large group of people without creating new opportunities or creating new jobs? No, I don't think that's going to happen. I think we'll, we'll see, um, you know, the innovation, the technology, create new jobs, create new opportunities. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's like an old adage about, uh, you know, cars putting out um, like horse and carriage drivers, you know, like what, you know, like they, you know, whatever, but it, it, you know, I, I, it's one of those things, Chris, that I think it's like, it's like a fun argument, but in reality, the, the data history doesn't really support it. Yeah. I mean, AB, you, you brought the fire with that argument, right? Using some real case examples. I, I think that's spot on, right? And you said it's an argument. There's always going to be the argument for technology and, you know, innovation, right? There's always going to be an argument of the positive and the negative it could have. And I think we tend to, you know, as society to lean on, you know, the negative side of things with possible, you know, job loss or, you know, how it will impact the environment and other issues instead of focusing on the positives. I mean, I think a trucking industry overhaul here, I mean, we're, we're as a society, right, where everyone wants to order products online, right? They want to order products online, have them shipped to their house as soon as possible, well, right now, you know, trucking and, you know, airlines, they, they can't keep up with that, right? You know, we're already hearing that during Christmas time this year, there could be major delays, um, you know, in shipping. And, and part of that comes from, you know, the ports and, and China and the shipping container issue, but also here in the U.S., right, from being able to handle the logistics. So, you know, our, I, I think the job argument is, is overdone at this point. And I, I look forward to, you know, changes in the trucking industry. Yeah, uh, you know, 100%. I mean, I think, you know, like anything else, I mean, like, like, if we're talking about changing from, uh, you know, uh, like oil and gas into clean energy, if you're in that industry, like if you work in oil and gas, you have like an opportunity to, to, you know, get a new job in clean energy, or you can, you know, be upset that the, you know, times are changing and, and things are going to clean energy and not, um, you know, but I, I don't know. I think it, it, it'll be interesting seeing what happens there. I, I, I'm looking forward to, I think, having, I don't know if you've ever had any close encounters with some semis on the road. I have, I, I'm looking forward to uh, in my lifetime that there will be, you know, some, some computers driving the cars as opposed to people. Yeah, I, I think we've all had those moments, right, where semis uh, rule the road, um, you know, so uh, interesting there. Um, uh, AB, while I've got you on here, you know, I, I talked about Genius Sports in the headlines, right? G-E-N-I, they've got earnings tomorrow. They're the thing behind the thing, you know, providing data for sports betting. Uh, I'm curious, you know, Aaron, because Mitch and I talk about sports betting all the time. Uh, the NFL season starting what do you think of these sports betting names? Do you think they've already, you know, seen that rise and, you know, we're not going to see more going into the NFL season? Do you think it's going to take some strong earnings reports or do you think, you know, we're, we're still in a, a value stage here going into this major sports betting event of college football and NFL? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it's tough because something like that, Chris, I think it's expected. So you can argue that it's priced in, you know, that it's expected that people are going to be betting more with college football and NFL football. Now, if people start betting more than what was expected, then we could be talking about a boost, you know, in the DraftKings, in the Pens, in the Round Hill, Bet Z. Um, but right now, I mean, I, I think, as I said, that it's priced in that people know people are gonna be betting more. So I'm not looking for that as like a huge catalyst. Um, but I think we'll get data right after week one, like is, will DraftKings see more, uh, people betting on there than they anticipated? Or will they see about in line or less? Um, so, you know, I, th I think that'll be the question and, and we'll see pretty clearly, um, you know, after week one, and maybe we'll see something like more people bet week one than week two, just because it's, you know, fresh and exciting. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, Chris, I, I don't know where you stand on a lot of these uh, gambling stocks. Yeah, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the sports betting market overall. I don't have any in my portfolio right now. Um, you know, I tend to like the ETF, right, with bets, um, because it's got exposure to all the foreign names as well, the technology players. But, I'm really watching Genie tomorrow, right? They're going to report earnings before market open. And I'm wondering, you know, 
how big of a catalyst that could be for the whole sports betting industry, right? If Genie comes out of the gates, they report a strong quarter and then they raise their guidance and they talk about, you know, the growth of the NFL, how many more states are, you know, legalized, how much more is being bet. I'm wondering if that could, you know, move the whole sports betting market higher tomorrow, you know, just based off of that uh, guidance from them. And again, that's just me expecting them to really, you know, offer up some sort of guidance uh, looking out. Yeah, I mean, 100 percent. I'm I, I again, this is kind of similar back to, as I was saying about the, you know, self-driving EV space. The The space is just so young. Um, so, you know, like it, it doesn't to me like putting something like, you know, a, a small allocation to DraftKings or to the bet Z, uh, you know, thing just makes a lot of sense because I think we're going to see how this develops like over time. And is there a possibility that 10 years from now, uh, you know, people are like, you know, maybe it wasn't a good thing that we legalized gambling. Maybe we need to go back. That is a possibility, but I think it's more likely that the space grows, um, and becomes wildly profitable. Uh, and someone in the chat was asking for a source when I was saying that um, a lot of studies have shown that automation actually creates more jobs than destroys. Um, so here's a, a study from the World Economic Forum that showed, I think they estimated about 75 million jobs would be lost due to automation and about 125 million would be uh, you know, gained from, from te technological advancements. And again, th this is something that I, I, and I wasn't like prepared to make this argument, so I didn't have all this data ready. But this is something that people have been, you know, saying or warning about for, I, I said the 40s or 50s around World War II, talking about computers, but even going back to Industrial Revolution time, like around uh, the Civil War time, there were people saying, you know, these factories are going to, you know, cause workers to lose their jobs. And, and so this goes all the way back to the 1800s of people being worried about technology um, essentially taking jobs away from humans. And we've seen over time that it's just not true. And, 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 and in places where you don't adopt the technology is actually where you hurt yourself more. AB, I didn't know that someone called you out in the chat. I mean, you, you brought the fire and here they are telling you, Hey, where are the facts at? I mean, it's not that they called me out. They were right. I mean, if you, if you make a claim, for a source, yeah, I mean, yeah, if, you, if you make a claim, you should cite your source, you should show the information, but it's, I, I didn't come on here like, Oh, Chris is going to ask me about automation. It just happened. And I spoke my mind. And of course, you know, you can go back and corroborate that claim with, with evidence after the fact, but uh, you know, it, it, it is what it is. Chris, real quick before we have to go, because I know this is a stock we've talked about before. Look at the price action on on Array, not A R R Y, not just today, but for the past uh, you know month really. It's up forty five percent over the last month. Oh the my stock's gosh! Been I almost down. got into this one. This is like my favorite solar play because they they have the patents and the technology, right? So they 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 are able to sell it right they're not making you know all the solar panels they're not making you know the infrastructure they're licensing out that technology for for the solar panel the rows of them this thing got beaten down a little bit but i mentioned this way back on election night when we did an election night coverage and we were looking for you know potential winners under a biden administration and i said solar energy i love it a r r y uh, Aaron, I know you've talked about this one recently. I mean, this thing is, is looking pretty strong here. Yeah, Chris, I, if I were you, I would just say that you pitched this stock and not necessarily say when. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if you pull back on that chart, it's not as pretty, is it? <laughs> right, right. Um, all right, Chris, well, we do have to have to head over to Power Hour. We got an exciting show there today. Two interviews today. Um, we have Add a Text at 1210 and then a uh, biotech company. Let me get the... Artello Biosciences at 12:30. Um, so should be an exciting show. This stream will automatically redirect you there. Uh, Solar up. I hope I see you in Power Hour. Let me know if you find research. I guess that shows the opposite that automation will destroy jobs and not just people kind of like claiming that or writing opinion pieces. Um, because I, I do like to go off of like historically what's happened. And as I said, historically technology automation has created jobs, but. I, you know, not to have an argument or anything, but I would like to see if you're able to find some, you know, because I'm I'm open minded. I'll I'll change my mind if, if that's what the evidence supports. Um, but Chris, any any final words? Any final thoughts? That's it, guys. You know, a a b. Thank you for joining me on the show today again, guys. We had that great interview. M Bark going public. N G A B. 
Uh, and as Aaron said, stay tuned for Power Hour coming up next. This stream will redirect there. You don't want to miss it. As he said, some exciting interviews coming up. And I will have Mitch back with me tomorrow. Spax Attack, 11 a.m. Eastern time as always. Smash that like on your way out and subscribe to Benzinga if you are not already. Take care, everybody.